really early 1900s on up to about 1919, 1920. That's the period of these quote unquote border troubles. One of the arguments that I make is that looking at that time frame really misses all of the stuff that happened before. Right? And so there were a lot of these examples of border violence that really predate um, that per period. So I think it's important to acknowledge um, that this is what I'm going to be talking about is actually the product of several generations of racial violence. You're going to use the word bandit a lot. And a lot of times, as you saw in the outline, I'm going to use that with, with air quotes or with quote quotes. Um, bandit as a term by the late 19th and into the early 20th century had basically become a racial code word for Mexican people, right? So when people said bandit, in the Southwest, that's pretty much who were they, who they were talking about. Um, before this period, back in the 1850s, 1860s, a lot of white outlaws, Billy the Kid, for example, might have been referenced in the same way. By the 20th century, it's a, it's a racial code word uh, for Mexican origin people. Um, and it's one with a whole lot of like meaning behind it. There's the sort of general racist stereotypes that people have about Mexican origin people at this time. They're racially suspect. Um, these are the, the sort of fixation of of, of white people, uh, uh, you know, in the white mind of what of what or who Mexican origin people are. They're racially suspect. They're foreign, even though, right? They're they're basically indigenous to the region. Um, um, there there's a lot of sense of bar barbarity, like the Mexican people are barbaric. They they're less than or other. And then you add that, add to that the criminal, uh, like the criminality stuff that I mentioned before, right? The sense that they are criminally prone and uh, prone to uh, 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 commit murder, uh, especially. And really, that term "bandit" becomes like the worst iteration of all of those different um, ideas. It kind of comes to to to, to encapsulate them all. Um, and basically, for Americans, you know, bandits were criminals. They were bad people. They were killers. They didn't care about law or justice or whatnot. So if if these quote unquote bandits were eliminated, you know, so much the the better. I do make the argument, and I'll talk about this in just a little bit, that many of the so-called bandits in the Southwest only became bandits after an ugly encounter with white law enforcement. So I think that's an interesting point to make because a lot of times the very people that police and extra legal groups are saying that they fear are being created by the police who abuse um, those particular people. Um, and then last but not least, I do want to underscore that there were real bandits, right? This was a time when there were bandits in operation and banditry on both sides of the border. Um, but a lot of the bandits that uh, uh, I'm going to talk about and that we're going to um, um, see in this lecture uh, really weren't bandits at all. They might be imagined bandits or labeled a bandit, but they uh, they weren't actually um, lawbreakers in that particular way. So background, book cover. I think they did a great job. I think it's really, really pretty. Yeah, can I get some head? Thank you. My daughter is going to agree with me. That's great. We'll talk about this picture in just a little bit. Um, but as I indicated, so Mexican people uh, and uh, bandits, I'm going to give you again a couple of different examples um, to show you kind of what I mean by how these folks are created and, and how they're treated. And again, how they predate um, this particular uh, period. So one of the most famous bandits uh, in Southwestern uh, history is Joaquin Murieta. Uh, Murieta is uh, originally a, a, an immigrant from Sonora, Mexico. Uh, in 1849, I think we are all aware that some gold was discovered in California, and he was one of the first people to arrive to, to stake a claim. Uh, he staked out a pretty good claim. He was able to bring his brothers up to help him uh, work the mine. Um, but one of the things that also happened, and this, this was the case in, in a lot of the different uh, mining regions in California, because of their proximity, Mexican origin people, and in addition to that, Chinese people especially, uh, were often the first ones on the scene. And white people in eastern parts of the United States were often promised that California was going to be this land of milk and honey, and you could really, literally walk around and kick gold nuggets. Well, they arrive in California and find A, that gold mining is really hard work and B, the most you know, valuable claims that in many cases already been staked out by others. Um, and so for these folks, there's this sense that this guy doesn't belong. He's not an American like us, even though he, you know, he's just about as American as anybody else, I guess. Uh, he had, you know, he didn't need to be there. He's on our land. And so we can kick him off. 
The story of Murrieta, we're not really 100% um, sure about. Uh, there's been a lot of misinformation because a, a writer wrote a, uh, a popular fictionalized novel about his um, life. Uh, but what we think happened is that a group of men operating basically as a vigilante group or a vigilance committee, uh, when they killed his brother, they forced him off of his um, claim and then took it over for themselves. And so he becomes what I call a vengeance bandit because his idea is he wants to strike back. Um, and one of the things you'll notice if you read into his history is a lot of the people that he attacks are either members of the military who at that particular time operated like law enforcement or law enforcement um, themselves. He became such a feared figure in California that the California government called out what were then called the California Rangers. They were actually Texas Rangers from Texas. California got rid of the California Rangers pretty quickly, but they hunted down uh, Murieta and executed him. And because he had basically caused so much fear to allay the fear of the white citizenry in um, California that actually preserved his head in formaldehyde and took it on sort of a, as you can see with that advertisement there, took it on a traveling tour, basically to show people, to literally be able to show people, we got him, he's dead, you don't have to worry about him. I'm sure you can make out that his head is actually in the jar right there. He had an accomplice whose name was Three Finger Jack because he had lost a finger. They cut off Three Finger Jack's hand and took it as well so they could show they got uh, Three Finger Jack. But think about what I'm saying about this period of banditry, right? And here we have a guy from the 1850s, right? So this early 20th century stuff about that's when, you know, bandit troubles were really not, not the case. And here's a guy that was um, made a bandit by an extra legal um, group operating like law enforcement. Uh, Juan Cortina is another really good example. He's what I call a revolutionary bandit. Again, not really a bandit at all, um, more of a revolutionary. Uh, he was from a well-to-do family in Texas. They had lived in the Texas border region for generations. They were a large landholding family. Uh, he had a lot of political power, a lot of wealth. Um, and what happened with Juan Cortina is 18, 1859, so this is a handful of years after um, uh, Murrieta, in 1859, he encountered a law enforcement officer, a uh, town marshal in Brownsville named Robert Shears, beating a Mexican man up, and his name was Tomas Cabrera. Cabrera was someone who had worked for Juan Cortina on his property, and so he knew this person. Um, Juan Cortina intervenes on behalf of his friend, colleague, employee, however you want to put it, and um, when he tries to get this uh, officer from to stop beating his friend, the, the officer, this guy, Marshal Shears, responds really insolently with like, you know, what is it to you, you damn Mexican kind of thing. And Cortina's response is quite literally to draw his pistol and shoot the marshal, uh, shoots him in the shoulder. So he is wounded, um, but stops the beating. And what he actually said, I, I, I told my wife this, I tell lots of friends, I love this line and I'll never get tired of saying it. But Cortina said after the fact, about this marshal was, quote, I punished his insolence and avenged my countrymen by shooting him with the pistol and stretching him at my feet. It's like, I don't know, I love that line, right? Um, Cortina had a lot of things to say about white encroachment uh, in Texas and the American takeover. Uh, he called white people and um, Americans more generally vampires. Um, and if you think about that terminology and how he was using it, it makes a lot of sense called them vampires in the guise of men, right? So they may look like men, but they're really not. And he, and he said that Americans came in with what he called the most corrupt heart and intentions and basically took from Mexican people. So he does this and then goes to, goes to Matamoros, which is just across the border. Um, a posse forms and eventually some Texas Rangers come to help out and they try to chase him down um, he responds by going back and sacking Brownsville. And so he actually takes over, he and his men actually take over Brownsville uh, for a period of time. And this, this is what is often referred to as the first Cortina War, right? So I don't know, anytime you have things labeled wars, I think it says something, yes? Um, a lot of talk, there's been a lot of writing on the on these wars, right? On this particular war and what happened. There's been a lot of writing about his bravado 
and how the white government basically had to pay him and his men like a ransom to get them to leave. What I found to be important was when they when they went and sacked Brownsville, what he and his men attacked was every vestige of the criminal justice system. So they, they attacked the marshal's office, they attacked the sheriff's office, they attacked the jail, they attacked the attorney general's office, they attacked the courthouse. Everywhere you could see an, an instance or an example of the criminal justice system, that's what they attacked. So, you know, really interesting individual. And if you think about what I just told you, really more revolutionary than just, you know, uh, a bandit. This is Gregorio Cortez. Bandit who wasn't a bandit. So Cortez gets labeled a bandit. Um, he's really not. 1901, uh, he and his brother and his wife and children were relaxing after a hard day's work when the sheriff rolled up. Um, the sheriff had a deputy who served as translator and basically asked um, Cortez if he had recently sold a horse. The translator used the word caballo, a male horse. Uh, Gregorio Cortez responded by saying, no, I didn't sell a male horse. He said, I sold a yegua, a female horse, a mare. The translator didn't understand, didn't understand the terminology, told the sheriff he's lying. He, he, you know, he's not telling you the truth. The sheriff got off his horse to actually they were in a wagon, so got out of the wagon to arrest uh, Cortez. He heard the word arrest, which is a cognate in Spanish and immediately got up and was like, what are you gonna arrest me for? I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, the sheriff took that as an affront and withdrew his pistol, in which case Cortez, is, cause Cortez was armed too, and I think his brother knew probably what was gonna happen. His brother Romaldo tried to get in between the two men. I think the sheriff probably took that as a sign of aggression or a threat. Uh, maybe if we use the lingo that we often hear today, he feared for his life, started shooting, shot and wounded Romaldo, Gregorio Cortez shoots back and ends up shooting and ultimately killing uh, the sheriff. Romaldo dies uh, several weeks later as well. Cortez then becomes a wanted man and he proceeds to go on an almost week long, like there's a week long manhunt of a huge posse in Texas Rangers that that follow him and ultimately capture him. And um, you know, it's, it is sort of surprising. There was an opportunity or a chance uh, for folks to lynch him. It's an interesting moment in that uh, in this particular case, the ranger that arrests him refuses to let that happen. Uh, but we do get these. This one's a postcard. Anybody familiar with lynching photography is going to be familiar with this. This is a postcard that you could literally mail around to your family and friend and be like, hey, you know, we had a great day at church the other day. And, you know, granny's doing fine. And oh, by the way, they got Gregorio Cortez kind of thing. Um, similar with this picture here. You can see him um, in the middle there. Uh, I'll just say briefly, he was... Um, he was tried for a lot of these different things. Uh, so, for example, tried for uh, shooting and murdering the sheriff, tried for horse theft, uh, tried for a lot of different things, um, basically got off on just about all of the charges except for um, killing uh, the sheriff. Uh, ultimately, however, that was also um, he was actually a pardon by the governor uh, who decided that it was a clear cut case of, of self-defense. Um, so regarded as a bandit, oftentimes called a bandit, but but really not, just really somebody, I guess, that got put into a bad situation and, you know, responded, I suppose, as best as he could um, at that particular time. And then I wanted to mention Chico Cano, uh, who is the person uh, in the sombrero in the middle there. Uh, this is the image that became the cover for the book. Uh, I really like this image. For a lot of different reasons, um, one, it's got two of, of, of Kano's brothers um, in the picture, and they're rarely photographed. Uh, it's got one of his main adversaries in this gentleman here. His name is Leonard Matlack. Uh, he's a captain. Um, and then it's got uh, Matlack's commanding officer. This is John Tiger Jack Constantine. Uh, Constantine, excuse me. Um, and this picture, we think, was probably taken... Around 1918, 19, uh, 1919, not 100% sure of the date. Uh, by this point, he had become a revolutionary in the Mexican Revolution at the time. Um, and so we think this picture was probably taken at a meeting that was designed to kind of calm um, tensions. I should al also say I really like this image because um, of just how Kano has kind of posed himself. You know, he's got the cigar and with his 
sort of hip cocked to the side and he's got the chaps and the sombrero and he just looks I don't know he just looks really tough and and, and cool to me I would use other language but we're um, we're recording this and being broadcast so I'm gonna keep it uh, I'm gonna keep it G um, so what was what was um, Chico Cano's deal um, so what ended up happening so he was he, he was born and raised in Mexico he and his brothers um, operated a, a small uh, cattle ranch just across the border from um, Candelaria Texas uh, and there was a former Texas Ranger who was a U.S. Uh, uh, Mounted Patrol a Customs official uh, at this particular time, a guy named um, Joe Sitter, uh, who decided that even though his his own ranch was more than 100 miles away, that all of the lost cattle, all the cattle that had made, made it, you know, been rustled or lost, that Chico Cano was the man that had done it, right? And so he decided that he would go with several other men and uh, arrest um, Cano. And they were originally going to go to Mexico. They were actually going to go across the border and make this um, arrest. If you're hearing things that maybe sound a little fishy, like a little funny, you know, go with that instinct, right? So this would, this would ordinarily be something that, that, that this officer would have to get a warrant um, to do. Um, that did not happen. The other thing is, uh, you're not supposed to cross borders to do stuff like this unless you've gone through a whole lot of international channels, which they did not go through. And last but not least, at this particular time, Joe Sitter was a customs official, which basically meant taxation and any kind of like border trade. That was his purview, not actual kind of law enforcement in this particular way. And they actually got lucky in a way in that... Um, Cano and his brothers had gone to the wake of a family friend in Marfa, Texas. So they were actually in Texas. Um, um, Cano later talked about how he would have not given himself up, but for the fact that they were at a wake and he was worried about what might have happened to the family and friends that were there. And so he allowed them to arrest him. Um, but shortly thereafter, um, um, two of his brothers, and one is not um, um, pictured here, Robillardo, um, they decided to go and and actually break their brother out, right? So they actually intervened while they were taking him to jail and ended up getting in a shootout with these um, officers. Uh, kind of escapes. Um, Sitter is wounded, but not um, uh, but not killed. Um, and then um, some of the other people, uh, a cattleman in particular, uh, was shot in the abdomen and died um, several days uh, later. After this, Chico Cano becomes a bandit, right? After this, he becomes a bandit and later becomes a revolutionary leader in the Mexican Revolution, where he also basically commits sort of incursions and or bandit-style raids. So he's a really good example of how law enforcement, and the other folks in some ways are as well, right, of how law enforcement creates um, the very individuals that they are basically trying to avoid or stop. Okay. So a lot of this violence, a lot of the things that we're talking about lead not just to murder, right? Not just to killing. And when I say murder, I mean that in the kind of legal sense of an extrajudicial killing, um, um, but also actual massacres. Right? And some of these are really uncomfortable. So I'm going to again kind of give you this uh, uh, trigger warning um, about what is uh, uh, what what is uh, happening here. And the other thing I wanted to mention is again we can start much earlier than the early 20th century. So one of the raids that I write about and that I like to talk about is what's known as the Nueces Town um, raid. Nueces Town is a small community at the time, just on the outskirts of Corpus Christi. Um, the details are still not 100% clear about what happened. Um, a group of raiders, Mexican raiders, came in and um, robbed a number of ranches and robbed the store in particular of, of its saddles um, and then and actually kept some, that took some hostages as well, which they later released, and then sort of vanished. That's what was oftentimes reported in the news. One of the other things that was reported was Chico, or excuse me, Juan Cortina, the guy that I mentioned before on the Cortina Wars, was actually the person that was responsible for this. So this is oftentimes associated with what's known as the Second Cortina War. He was in Mexico. It's really unclear if he had anything to do with it. And in fact, he denied it. 
um, but the press at the time denied his denial. Uh, there was also a lot of speculation that this was actually white uh, white individuals basically masquerading as Mexicans to commit these kind of robberies, and that also is uh, dismissed by the press uh, in favor for the uh, you know the story about the Mexicans. Um, what ends up happening is that white people in the region organize themselves, both with law enforcement and without, into these posses or vigilance committees or vigilante groups. Um, they oftentimes refer to themselves as, let me make sure I get the name correct if I have it in here. I think they called them, I don't see, I'm not seeing it in my notes, but I think they called them like basically in essence sort of like minute, minute men or minute companies. So they're on the on the ready, um, you know, uh, in, in a minute's notice. Um, and what they did was they basically sort of went through the countryside and just about killed any Mexican person that they found in, in Southern uh, Texas. Uh, the number of people that are ultimately killed, we think is probably uh, close to 100, if not greater than that. The Rangers actually came in and law enforcement was a part of this as well. Law enforcement actually encouraged people to shoot any Mexican person that they saw that seemed to have a new or near new saddle because saddles had been robbed from this um, this store, right? So basically just having a saddle could get you killed and a number of people died in that particular way. It got so bad that the government actually sent in the Texas Rangers to stop it, which they did, stop these vigilante groups, which they did, but then the Texas Rangers basically picked up where the, where the vigilante groups had um, uh, left off. Um, they started killing people. Um, in one particular instance, um, we believe they killed 13 men. They, now, they said they found these men um, dead, but the speculation at the time was that they killed them and then found them um, dead. And they actually drugged their bodies to um, uh, to Brownsville and laid them out on the on the on the uh, central green, the, 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 the square green, um, basically as a public display of ranger power and as a warning to uh, Mexican origin people. Um, so Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria are two good examples of something that I've already talked about that I haven't named, and that is a process um, uh, 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 I'm not sure what to call it, like a, a pseudo-legal, actually it's legal in many cases, uh, concept that's known in Spanish as the ley de fuga, or ley fuga, the law of flight. Um, this is a, again, in many cases, a, actually a legal, like legally allowed thing. In other cases, it's legality is just sort of unclear and it happens. But basically said, you know, if somebody tried to escape, if they ran away, you could shoot them in the back, right? Um, so if you think about some of the, uh, uh, different cases, I guess, that, that, that could have gone along, for example, with the Nueces Town rape, people trying to escape, shot in the back, uh, you know, everything's okay. That's what happened with these individuals, uh, and I'm hoping y'all are maybe able to make out the, uh, the, the writing. Um, what ended up happening, and this is in 1915, is, uh, uh, and these were well-respected individuals, they, they owned property, and they had had some horses that were um, stolen, and so they went to an encampment of Texas Rangers to basically uh, report this theft. Uh, the captain on duty there is a guy named Henry Ransom. He's actually a really, really famous um, Texas Ranger. Um, they report it to him. They leave. And as they're literally departing and like walking down the road, the Rangers get in their Model T with so several other men, drive by and, and mow them down. They just, they just, it's literally a, uh, a drive-by um, shooting and kill these two men, uh, leave their bodies on the side of the road, actually refuse to allow families to retrieve the bodies, again, as a sign, I guess, of ranger power or, uh, you know, or, or whatever. There was often talk in the newspaper that Bazan and Longoria were bandits or were associated with bandits or something like that. There's always some kind of bandit connection, right? Um, but in fact, these were actually like literally truly innocent individuals. They had done absolutely nothing wrong. They had actually done the right thing, reported a crime, and it ended up getting shot in what we would call today uh, uh, a drive-by shooting. Uh, one of the other cases, uh, do I have a slide for this one? Yeah. Um, was a case of Florencio Garcia. This is another lay fuga killing. This one in 1918. 
Um, we're not 100% sure happened, what happened with this because he disappeared and nobody knew what happened to him. And his family actually, you know, basically went to local law enforcement a number of times to say, you know, can you please go and look for our son? He was a good boy, you know, to help us find him. They eventually found um, skeleton remains and they weren't even going to report it to the family, but the family happened to be there one day when they had made this discovery. And they're like, yeah, we did find something. And they described the clothing and they were like, that that was him, right? Um, he had been shot in the back uh, a number of times. And what we what they found out after, after this is actually a, a pretty serious investigation by the Mexican government, as well as the, the, uh, the, the local county government. It's one of the things I talk about that I should mention, but I'm not going to talk about a lot today, is just the, the role that the Mexican government plays and oftentimes securing aid for Mexican people. Um, so they implement an investigation and they find out that um, uh, several different rangers, George Sadler, John Sitter, and Alfred Locke, and you can see uh, Sadler and Locke's name uh, on this uh, newspaper clear, uh, clipping, um, had actually uh, allegedly taken Garcia into custody uh, for robbery, and then something happens. Who knows? What they said after they were caught was he tried to get away. He ran away, and that's why he was shot in the back. Um, but in fact, um, uh, Florencio Garcia hadn't done anything wrong, and this was really, well, you know, if you think about what we call a, a sort of legalized um, lynching. Um, his parents file suit and ultimately put a lot of pressure on the county government to bring charges. Um, and this is a newspaper clip, clipping that basically talks about um, some of that um, early legal work. Um, but ultimately what happened is the officers, as is the case again in, in many of these instances, and I would add hearings like this are inc incredibly rare, um, but they are excused by the, by the grand jury. So they were ultimately no build um, and uh, went back uh, to, their, to their work. Right. So a lot of those we can see like clear cut murder. Nueces town is really early. We're now in the 20th century and we have a lot of these, um, uh, you know, Bazan and Longoria individuals murdered, um, Garcia and individual murder. But we also had uh, have had, as I indicated, a number of times where groups of bandits were, were killed and we consider these today to be massacres. Right. And a lot of times what we have the data that we have is literally a ranger report with a single date entry that says killed this number of bandits at this location. And that's it, right? That, that tells you a lot. A, it tells us we don't have a lot to go on, right? There's not a lot of information to say this is what actually transpired and so and so this, you know, they were up there. We don't have any of that information. All we have is that little notation. But it tells you a lot because that's all you needed. That's all you needed to say if you were law enforcement to basically be excused from killing people, right? So there was an encounter with a group of rangers and um, and I'll use the, the air quotes here, bandits. We don't know if they were bandits or not. The rangers said they were bandits at the small town of Ebenoza in Texas. This is in September of 1915. Uh, they captured a dozen men um, and, and summarily hanged them. So summarily uh, executed them. Anytime you have more than I don't know. I don't even know if there's the what the exact number for a massacre is. I probably should know that. But I'm just going to say, anytime you have more than a dozen people, like it's no longer just a just a murder, right? It, it becomes a massacre at that point. Um, the next month, uh, near the small town of Lyford in Texas, uh, the Rangers found another dozen Mexicans dead. And this was another one of these cases where they speculate that the um, that the Rangers actually did the killing and then found these individuals, quote unquote, found them. Uh, one of the other things that happens this is very similar to what I kind of mentioned before about, um, you know, the quest uh, by Joe Sitter to get Chico Cano and cross the border. Throughout this period, U.S. troops and Texas Rangers periodically uh, crossed the border and, and did so uh, legally, or I should say illegally, and without authorization, ended up getting into battles or fights and killing people. So you can see U.S. troops and Rangers kill six Mexican bandits. Um, and actually what they talked about this is a small town of San Jose in uh, in Mexico just across the border um, the ranger report actually said that they uh, quote did not take the trouble to count the bandit dead but six bodies were seen and officers officers say there were probably several others in the brush this was actually a town uh, the rangers went in looking for I, I suppose looking for bandits 
the townspeople defended themselves and they had actually all but routed this group of rangers and soldiers when a late arriving machine gun platoon came in and mowed down these people, right? So bandits or townsfolk? These were more than likely just townspeople. But once you attach that label, that's all you have to do to say, yeah, no, we're good. International incident, doesn't matter. Just excuse it. Um, this one here is, is, is very similar. Uh, but in that particular case, there were at least eight Mexicans um, that were killed. And again, it's the same kind of uh, same kind of process um, that happens. Uh, and then the worst example of this in, is what is known in Texas as the Poor Veneer Massacre. Poor Veneer is a small, uh, primarily Mexican uh, farming village, probably 100 to 150 uh, people. Um, and in January of 1918, there had been a, a raid, and we think probably by Mexican revolutionaries, on a nearby ranch called the Bright Ranch. Um, for whatever reason, folks at the Bright Ranch and the Texas Rangers and people in the Army decided that Poor Veneer was actually probably the place where the culprits were. Now, in fact, they, they knew actually that wasn't the case. It was just a really convenient um, a really convenient argument to say, you know, yeah, it was the folks at Poor Veneer, we should go there. Um, and one of the things that they actually said when they went, the, the, these, these, the Rangers and these soldiers went on two different occasions on the night of January 27th, 1918. And on that night, they disarmed the town, right? So they collected all fire, firearms and returned the next night. Both nights they went, one of the people they said they were looking for was Chico Cano, right? So they literally use his name as an excuse or a justification to raid this town. And what happens on the night of January 28 is actually after rousing um, the, the villagers from their sleep, um, this group of rangers and, and army officers se uh, separated a group of 15 men and boys. The rangers actually took them just outside of town to a bluff and simply executed them, simply executed them. And as the rangers actually, there was all the shooting and the, the army officers that were there, they had remained in the town were like, you know, what the heck is going on here? The Rangers, as they were leaving, said, we got him. We got him. And we believe the him that they were saying they got was Chico Gano, but they did not get him. 15 men and boys, ranging in age from 15 to their 60s. I just executed, just killed gone. Um, the ranger that did this was a captain by the name of James Fox. His report, as I mentioned just a little while ago, as these ranger reports go, said only that he had killed 15 bandits at Port Veneer. He killed 15 bandits. Uh, other reports after, because pretty quickly the word leaks out and the townspeople are like, no, no, they did came in and did not do what they said they did. Um, the rangers then and these other officers defended themselves uh, by labeling the residents of Poor Veneer as, quote, bandits, bandit gangs, thieves, informers, spies, and murderers to justify uh, their killing. Um, Fox's company, this guy James Fox, the ranger that was in charge of this, it was dissolved, um, but he was never really punished for this and, and went, back to, went back to duty. So his company was dissolved which meant that period, for a period of time, he lost his job, but then he was subsequently rehired um, by, the, um, by the Texas Rangers. So I don't know about you, of all, all of y'all, right? Anytime I, I hear some, a story like this, and there's a really great book by a woman, Monica Munoz Martinez, called The Injustice Never Leaves You, and she describes the, the carnage and the, the human tissue and blood on the bluff and that sort of thing. It's really, it's really quite upsetting. Um, I think it's not really surprising that not only would people be really, really upset, but they would be really upset about all of the stuff um, that had gone on. And so there was a pretty big push to try to do something about all of this. Um, how are we doing on time? I've been talking for 45 minutes, yes? Okay, so good, I'm almost done. Good, yeah, rock and roll. Um, so this gentleman, Jose Tomas Canales, he was one of the few, in fact, at the time, the only 
uh, legislators in the House of Representatives in Texas of Mexican ancestry. This is him, younger days, older days. Uh, he eventually becomes one of the people that helps found the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC. Um, he decides to put the Texas Rangers on trial for the atrocities that they had committed in his book over the past five years. Now, I think we can see he could have gone further than that. But what he said was, as far as I could tell, by about 1914, something had changed. And, you know, he wanted to uh, lead this investigation. Um, it's officially called the Joint Committee of the Senate and the House in the Investigation of the Texas Ranger Force. It is more commonly referred to as the Canales Investigation or the Canales Hearings. And this is the front cover of, um, of um, one of the uh, books on the, the hearing. So the, the hearing ultimately is, as you uh, can read there, the investigation is ultimately 1,600 pages long. So they divide it up into three different volumes. And this is uh, one of those um, particular vo volumes. Really, really kind of amazing stuff. Um, the investigation and the hearings took two weeks. They heard uh, testimony from 83 witnesses. And as I said, the final report was 1,600 pages long. They also issued a summary report that was much shorter as a way just to, as you might expect to sum up. He made 19 charges. The most significant charges, the most important ones for us, charge five, that the Rangers had murdered Florencio Garcia. Charge nine and 10 dealt with corruption in the Ranger leadership in particular. So the Rangers are led by what's known as an adjutant general. And that person has an investigatory office as well, right? So they have a, a chief investigative officer. Um, and, and Canales charged that that office had neglected um, its duties and was corrupt. And in particular, what he said was they always find evidence to exonerate these killings and not bring charges to the, to, you know, to the Rangers. So sort of like, a, a, you know, internal affairs that, that, uh, didn't, didn't work very well. Um, and then charge 11, that the Rangers under Captain James Fox had murdered 15 Mexican men and boys uh, the year before. And this hearing actually happens um, almost to the day of the Port Veneer uh, massacre. There's a lot that goes uh, into this. Um, I'm gonna put it to you as simply as I can. So because this thing is so long and there's so much testimony, a lot of the stuff that you just heard me talk about comes from this investigation. It's one of the types of evidence that we have that actually gives us a lot of information about some of these different killings. It also is filled with a lot of the racism that you might expect at this particular time. Um, so a lot of really ugly commentary on Mexican origin people, a lot of ugly commentary on their criminality. In fact, Canales himself is quite literally put on trial at the hearing, the investigation that he launched um, and what the attorney for the state, I love this, this guy's name is Robert E. Lee Knight. What attorney Robert E. Lee Knight does is basically say that Canales was sympathetic to the bandits and that's why he was doing this. He was trying to besmirch the name of the Texas Rangers. And why was he sympathetic to the bandits? because he was a Mexican origin person and the bandits as Mexican, he somehow must have had some kind of racial or ethnic solidarity um, with them. That strategy ultimately works. The Rangers are basically exonerated in this investigation. Really the one thing that comes out of it um, is the, the, the investigated, the report basically says that, yeah, you know that killing of Florencio Garcia, the guy that was shot in the back and they found the skeletal remains, that was there was something that was wrong there and what was uh reported by the rangers they said was unsatisfactory right so what happened was unsatisfactory in the reporting on it but other than that that's um, um that's about it so it's a really big deal lots of information a huge thing last multiple days right last nearly two weeks and you might think based on what i just told you that not really anything happened but some stuff does happen one of the things that Canales did is he called for, in the hearings, he called for a number of reforms of the Texas Rangers. And in fact, he had authored legislation before the Canales hearings um, to try to change the Ranger force, right? To try to adjust the Ranger force. That is what becomes this House Bill number five. They decided to put that on hold 
while the investigation, while the hearings were going on. After, however, this legislation brought back up. And based on what I just told you, and in fact, my own supposition when I was starting to look into this was they're just going to, there's nothing's going to happen. They're just going to, you know, it's going to be defeated, right? And in fact, it's not. Um, the Texas legislature, both houses vote for it uh, and vote for it actually in, um, in really significant numbers. Uh, and the governor uh, ultimately signs it uh, into law. His name is William Hobby, if you're interested. And Hobby's actually a pretty famous guy in Texas history and uh, in American history more broadly. And he has a nice little airport named after him in Houston. So this law did a lot of different stuff, right? It's really complex. I'm going to summarize it as quickly as I can. Um, the one thing that it did, or it did, let's see, five things that are really important. Uh, number one, it reduced the size of the Ranger Force. The Ranger Force had been augmented to deal with these border troubles. It was nearly a thousand men, and it had gone from like 24 men in 1905 to a thousand men by 1919. It reduced the size of the Ranger Force to 74 men. Uh, number two, it augmented the pay of the Rangers. This was seen as a really positive step in the professionalization uh, of the organization. The third thing was probably the most important. It said that the Rangers were, quote unquote, clothed with the power of peace officers, clothed with the power of peace officers. What that meant was that because there was really no law that prescribed what a Ranger's duties or the extent of their authority was, it actually put into legislation that they were bound by the same type of law and legislation that other uh, police officers were um, bound by. Uh, number four, It seems crazy to have to say this stuff out loud, but I guess after Florencio Garcia and other similar cases, number four specified that the Rangers had to transport, had to transport individuals that they had arrested to the county jail where those individuals were wanted. They had to transport them to the jail and turn these people over. I'm not sure, I, you know, my inclination is to think like, should they have had to say that? But I guess they um, actually did. And then the last thing is the, uh, the, the, the bill, again, which became a law, um, revised the leadership structure of the Texas Rangers, and in particular, changed the investigative powers of the adjutant general and his invest investigative um, offices, which would seem to vindicate that Canales' accusations maybe um, had some merit. Um, the other thing, uh, the other two that you see up here, uh, 174, and this is uh, Senate Bill number eight, uh, they do a number of different things, but I'll just give it to you really, really briefly. Uh, number eight um, is uh, is uh, protecting uh, uh, individuals from what is colloquially known as a third degree. And a third degree is basically people who are um, tortured to secure a confession, and then that confession is used against them. So that makes that illegal, even though there's a certain amendment to the United States Constitution uh, the Eighth Amendment, which would um, seem to suggest that cruel and unusual punishment of this time uh, of this kind is uh, uh, not permissible. And then that was 1923. The 1925 Senate Bill 74 that you see there, um, this is a bill to quote act uh, an act quote making the people secure in their persons, houses, papers, and possessions from all unlawful and unreasonable seizures and searches. One of the things that also happened in this period, as we as I mentioned with poor veneer. People could have their homes, um, the police could basically walk in, do or take whatever they want, and use that information if they found information against those people uh, in court. So this prohibited um, law enforcement. And they do state specifically any peace officer, state, state ranger, or other person um, are, is not allowed to do this. And this, as you might expect, is also protected by the Constitution, and that's in the uh, Fourth Amendment. And last but not least, 1935, the rangers were put under the Department of Public Safety in Texas, which actually created a whole new web of sort of control and um, and um, you know uh, policy that, that bound the Rangers and uh, their behavior. And I will say, one of the things that happens after the 1920s is these types of untoward Raid Ranger killings they they stop. Now there's still a lot of heavy handedness and uh, violence and beatings and that sort of thing that the Rangers do, still a lot of unkind individuals. But these things would tend to suggest that these reforms, which again have become known as the Canales reforms, actually um, did uh, quite a bit. 
Okay, but still have a lot of problems. Uh, in many ways, I would say the problems of the early 1900s are still with us. Uh, so for example, um, the bandit label still gets thrown around today. We still see that label thrown around and almost always uh, refer to uh, Mexican origin people. Um, the idea of extra legal justice still exists. Uh, if you're familiar with the Minuteman Project, which is still ongoing, this is a group of individuals who have decided to go and patrol the border on their own. And there have been a number of uh, interactions, ugly interactions with uh, Mexican um, undocumented immigrants that uh, uh, seem very familiar, uh, 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 similar to some of the stuff that we've talked about over the past hour. Um, you know, if you think about what the term bandit is, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a racial code word, but it's really a pass for racial profiling, right? Anybody who looks like a Mexican must be a bandit, ergo, they're a bandit, right? A lot of that's been replaced with what is known today as papers police policing, which is quite literally, you know, I have the authority. This is especially the case originally in Arizona with the uh, legislation uh, called SB uh, uh, 1070. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, that gives police literally the legal authority to racially profile people and um, seek their um, papers. Uh, Mexican Americans and other Latinos are more likely than white people to experience police brutality and the abuse of police authority. They're more likely to be killed by the police. They're more likely to be racially profiled during traffic stops and other police encounters. They're more likely to be accused of a crime and convicted when not guilty or plead guilty to a crime that they didn't commit. They're also more likely to receive the death penalty than white defendants and to be wrong, wrongfully executed for crimes that they did not commit. And I will pause just briefly to say, all of those things are true, but of course, African-Americans fare worse on all of those categories than Latino people do. And in a number of those different categories, um, indigenous people fare worse um, as well. This is not a competition, but it's important to note um, that other ethnic communities experience these same things. And of course, we know extra legal justice still happens. There was a massacre at the Walmart in El Paso in 2019. Uh, the individual uh, that committed this was a guy named Patrick Crucius. And he wrote a manifesto where he railed against what he called the Hispanic invasion and the Hispanic people. He said that his attack is a response to this Hispanic invasion. Um, he utilized a sort of multifaceted version of what is today known as the Great Replacement Theory. Um, he blamed lax policing and lax border security for this invasion. And so his reasoning for killing these people is basically an example of extra legal justice. The police aren't doing their job. They're not stopping this invasion. I must go and do it. And um, police killings still occur as well. Um, one of the things that I write about in the follow-up book is the number of Mexican origin children um, that are killed by police. It's a really, really sad, like a lot of this is sad. Police killing kids to me is so much worse. Um, and it happens throughout this period, especially in the 20th century. And it happened just last October um, in, in San Antonio. This is a kid named Eric Cantu. He was sitting in a McDonald's parking lot eating a burger. A San Antonio police officer named James Brennan thought that he recognized the car that Cantu was in as a stolen vehicle, walked up to the vehicle, opened the door with his gun drawn, and demanded Cantu, get out. That's all he said, get out. You can watch the video. I, I have to watch these videos because I need to know this stuff. It's really awful. I've gotten to the point where I really don't want to watch them. But if you watch the video, what you'll see, you can see the look on his face, yes? The look on Eric Cantu's face. He is totally shocked and caught off guard when this dude opens his door. He fidgets around, doesn't know what to do with himself, and puts the car into gear and starts to slowly back up. When he does that, the officer starts shooting. Now, he claimed the car door hit his arm, and that forced him to fire five times. And then, as you can see from this shot, as Cantu was slowly driving away, he shot five more times. Eric Cantu was 17 years old. He was in the car with his 17-year-old girlfriend. He was wounded, seriously wounded. I had to pull over a couple of blocks away. He was arrested, taken to the hospital. He spent more than a month in the hospital, was released then had complications and was readmitted to the hospital in December and is still there today. Um, I, I was updating the conclusion, which is where this story appears in my book. 
And every time I would have to go back and see, is he still in the hospital? And say, yes, after, you know, as of January 2nd, Eric Cantu is in still, as of January 14th, he's still in the, as of February 12th, he's still in the hospital. As I said, I finally submitted the book on February 13th. Eric Cantu was still in the hospital. It's now February 21st. He is still in the hospital. Um, I will say James Brennan, the officer was fired. He is now facing um, the charges of aggravated assault by a public servant and a single count of attempted murder. And we will see if Eric Cantu gets his justice. Uh, if we gauge this case by other cases that we've seen over the past several decades, um, not, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Uh, I've talked for uh, long enough. So I'm going to stop. And, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I see. I am happy to entertain questions. If anyone has questions. And I will bring you a microphone. You may. So we can all hear you. Thanks, Brian. That's fascinating. I have a quick question about bandits or heroes. You called Cortina a revolutionary and a red, which in some circles would be considered terms of praise rather than abuse. So are there quarters in which the individuals and groups who are labeled bandits are considered heroes? That's actually a really good question, Simon. Uh, and I think you probably know the answer to it. And the answer is yes. Um, in the Mexican-American community, in the Mexican and Mexican-American community, a lot of these individuals are seen as heroes. Um, so I started with Joaquin Murrieta. He's known as the Robin Hood of the El Dorado. Um, one, uh, Cortina, the Red Robber, right? Um, Gregorio Cortez, because of his bravery and standing up and then eluding law enforcement, hundreds of law enforcement officers and a posse, for uh, for a week um, is is seen as heroic. Um, Chico Cano is a hero that lives outlives a lot of the people that tried to kill him. Um, and I don't know if you noticed the text with with his image, but you know they uh, Rangers and other law enforcement tried to kill him like fourteen different times. And in particular, after that picture was taken, Leonard Matlack, who ha he hated, he hated Chico Cano. Um, Attempted to kill him after that, right, right after that picture was taken. I could, I could go on. All of these people are considered heroes in the Mexican American community. One of the ways that we know that is they get um, uh, a lot of them get corridos, corridos penned for them. A corrido is a, a Mexican, basically a Mexican folk song um, to talk about, to sing uh, their glory and exploits. And you know what a lot of these songs talk about is how they stood up and resisted resisted, you know, the abuse and the racism that they experienced. So, yes. It's always the, the getting the questions going. And I did not feed my spouse a, a softball question. No, you didn't. So I'm like, oh, I hope I don't stump him. So thank you. Um, you know, this was very hard to hear, but I, I, I was wondering as you were talking, if your research had revealed an overarching motive for the ranger behavior. Are we, is this behavior motivated by economic interest? Is this white supremacy? Is this lasting aggression from, um, you know, the wars that have been happening? What's your sense about what's motivating this behavior? I mean, I think you could look and say just about all of those things, like on the part of some of it, it's very, it's very clearly like there seems to be just clear, straight up racism going on. There are, the, the thing that I, I want to make clear, though, right, so yeah, it could be that um, there's actual like fighting going on. And so it could be that sense of like when you're in a war, like everybody that looks a certain way is the enemy and it's they're unwilling to distinguish or not careful enough or however you might want to put it. Um, I think, I think some of it is just simple, like a power dynamic. So one of the things that, that I write about in, in this, in these same, in the same chapter and the Canales stuff comes in the chapter after um, 
is the number of Mexican origin law officers, Mexican American law officers who are themselves abused by Texas Rangers. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a clear kind of power dynamic. So you can have the power dynamic of an individual who maybe is just a regular person, right? Or the power dynamic of an actual law enforcement official that you're able to um, uh, able to abuse. I think I think that I think there's a lot to it. So if I if I had to sum it up simply, I would say at this particular time, there was widespread hatred uh, of Mexican people because the revolution is going on and there are there are bandit raids and incursions that happen. It's just easy to say anybody's a bandit. That's why you have somebody like Bazan and Longoria who can simply just be uh, eliminated in that particular way. And you have this constant deluge in the press of stories about these bandits that are kind of constantly reinforcing that sense that everyone out there is out to get us. So I actually titled this chapter Bandits Everywhere because that was a sense that white people literally had that there was a bandit hiding behind every book, a bush or rock. And that's why you could have a poor veneer massacre. That's why you can have these individual shootings. Hatred, fear, anger, amplified by the period that you're in, amplified by the violence that's going on. And, and there you are. I mean, it's, it's a really ugly, potent mix. And I think that I think the thing is like, I mean, we hear that we hear that sort of line, like you know, it was just the the nature of the times, or so and so was a person of the times, or whatever. But there were a lot of people that knew this was wrong, right? They knew that what the Rangers were doing was wrong. They knew they were lying. They knew their violence was untoward, right? And something should have been done. And it, it you know, it finally took someone like J.T. Canales to basically come to the defense of a wounded people to say, we need to stop this. But I'm, I'm looking in my notes because I have this quote from a reporter, but not all reporters are willing to make these um, blanket accusations or whatever. This is a guy named George Marvin. I was writing for the socialist press, so they probably would have dismissed him at the time. Maybe not as much as we would have been dismissed in decades later. But in 1917, he said, the killing of Mexicans along the border in these last four years is almost incredible. Some rangers have de de degenerated into common man killers. There is no penalty for clear killing. No jury along the border would ever convict a white man for shooting a Mexican. Reading over Secret Service records makes you feel as though, as, as though it was an open gun season on Mexicans along the border. So maybe if you add that, right, not just anger, frustration, you know, power, but the fact that you're not, you can get away with it. Hey, Brian, thanks for this. This was uh, fantastic. Um, I, I had a question. I, I guess I wanted to kind of, um, I've, I've come to see the importance of really kind of getting under the hood of, of historical work and, and having historians share it. Right. Um, because you make this look easy. You present well, people want to listen to you. Uh, your prose flows, right? You I can give you more compliments if you wish, but um, it belies in some ways the work, the hard work you've put in, right? You said it took a decade, um, which is not unusual. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that research process and the sources in particular? I was struck by your comment that um uh, you said, you know, if you look in the Ranger books or whatever it is, it, all it says is 15, 15 Mexicans killed or 15 bandits killed. But then the story you've drawn out here is so much more nuanced and complex. And I guess I wanted to just hear you talk about that. Take us under the hood a little bit in, in, uh, with your research process and your sources. Yeah, thank you for that and all the nice comments. Uh, I'm not going to deny any of it. and not, I'm not going to let it go to my head at all. I am going to move back to this particular picture because I don't know the dude shooting Eric can too. I don't want to leave that up. And I'd much rather have this with Chico Cano looking cool and be like, ah, I wrote a book. Um, yeah. So, so, um, so like I said, this began really in about 2005. And I was doing research actually for my dissertation, my doctoral dissertation. 
and I'd come across the case of this um, 12 year old Mexican American boy who was executed by a Dallas police officer in 1973. Um, and that was really the genesis for me. I found this case at the time, it really hadn't been talked about. Uh, there was one book that, that mentioned it at the time. And I just had that thought like there, there's something, something's not right here. Something's going on. And I really thought it would just be like a 60s, 70s civil rights story. But the more research I did, the more I started to go further and further back in time. Um, so yeah, lot, lots of, I'll, I'll put it to you like this, um, Kathy, lots of individual research trips to archives in the Southwest. Um, lots of time, you know, thank goodness for LAS small grants, because I used a lot of those um, small grants. Um, so thank goodness for a patient um, caring wife, because a lot of times this was back when our kids were four, five, six, seven, on up to their early teens, perhaps. Um, but, you know, what I did, my, I guess if I had a research methodology, it's like to leave no stone unturned. So I go and I look at everything. And even if it wastes me a day, I, I look at everything. And what ends up happening when I do that is I find stuff that I don't think other people find. And kind of simultaneously when you do it, I can't tell you the number of, like you start to see threads when you're reading a, or you're writing a book and doing the research. I'm like, oh, that that's maybe going to be really important. That line, that line there, that analysis. So the bandit thing is one, but there's a thing that comes up in the 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 last chapter of the book, and this is in the 20s and 30s, where suddenly some of the language changes and it becomes more like like they still use bandit, but it's less serious because there's not all this violence attached to it in many cases. But stuff like crazed Mexican, um, especially in the late 20s and early 30s, reefer madness. Like there's a lot of these sort of like, and so then it's now somebody is behaving in a certain way because they're crazed on drugs. And that becomes the reason or the justification for how and why they could be victimized. It's, you know, you start to see like, oh, there's something there, right? So lots of newspapers, I'm a, I'm a big fan of newspapers, um, lots of criminal records. I look through criminal records that I don't think anybody like I sat in this office, this little teeny tiny office in San Antonio, um, made a really good friend um, who was the archivist there at the time, um, Donna Guetta. Um, I think I was looking at stuff that nobody ever looked at, right? And it was pretty dry and boring, but what it told me was this story of like who got charged, how they got charged, how they were treated. And a lot of it was like revelatory, right? So A, the most common crime that Mexican people uh, committed um, differed from town to town. Uh, in most communities and most states, the perception was that it was murder or if you were a woman, sex work. In fact, as it is today, in most cases, it's larceny, some kind of theft. Um, you might expect that if a court and the system is racist, and in, and in many ways institutionally it is, that it would sort of automatically find those people guilty and sentence them and maybe throw away the key. Uh, but, but I found that in fact, the justice system tended to treat Mexican and Mexican American defendants in pretty much the same way that they treated American defendants. Um, lots of different stuff, including some really fun stuff, like you know the thing that, the anecdote that starts the chapter on criminality is this gentleman, Valerio Garcia, that stole 500 sheep from a guy. And I remember finding that and just thinking, that's a lot of sheep, right? Like, I don't know how he got away with that, but it's a lot of sheep. And I started looking through all these, it's the same kind of thing, like these giant arrest log books and jail books, these individual sort of little, little documents that is the, you know, the warrant, the summons, the, the trial notes, the transcript of the trial and that sort of thing. I'd find a piece of his story in one archive, a piece in another I find a book in, a, in one of these arrest books where I would find his arrest. And I was able to piece together that this guy, Valerio Garcia, yeah, he stole 500 sheep. That's pretty incredible. The law enforcement community in Arizona then spent the next three or four years trying to track him down and expending considerable amounts of money to do that. They're not able to because he escaped to Mexico, but they tried. 
And so it becomes not just a story of criminality or what somebody did. I don't know, 500 sheep seems like a lot to me. That sounds cool and interesting, but also a story that says, hey, they tried really hard to get him. They sent people all over the place to try to capture him. What does that mean about all these people that are saying the justice system doesn't work? It's weak, it's lax. There's a disjuncture there, right? So pulling all that together in that way, I don't know if that really answers your question, but yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly what you might expect. You're in one archive and you find a little tidbit of information and you're like, that's really interesting. And then you go well, elsewhere, there's something similar going on here. And then you go elsewhere and you're like, I remember that name. I know I just took a photo of it so I could digest everything later on, but I remember that name and oh yeah, that was that guy. And then somewhere else, oh, that name, that was that guy. And here we are. So, and I will say, sorry, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of documents. So when I got a year of leave to write this one book, I wrote 500 pages and I wasn't done. And so ultimately what ended up happening is like the first six chapters of this 13 or 14 chapter book seem really different than these other chapters. So I wrote two. Brian, quick question. Can you just give us the short two minute history of the Texas Rangers? When, when and why did they start? You, you kind of brought us to the end of them, but I don't know how they got started or why. Yeah, so they are so they are originally credited. So we are in the um we are in the right now, the 200th anniversary year of the founding of the Texas Rangers. So there's a lot of Ranger stuff going on. There's also, I'm a part of a um a group called Refusing to Forget, um, which is actually doing a, a series of Twitter threads on actually quite a bit of the stuff that we've just talked about to provide a counter narrative to the usual sort of rah, 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 the Texas Rangers are great. So the original Rangers, uh, 1823, founded to protect, uh, basically as a, as a protect, protection group in Stephen Austin's uh, first colony in Texas. So if you're familiar with Texas history in this way, Stephen Austin's father, Moses, was the one that actually made the arrangement with Mexico. He dies. Austin sets up a colony, and it's literally that a group of families are allowed to come in and legally settle in Texas, and a number of colonies get formed, and eventually white uh, Texans outnumber Mexicans, and then they foment a revolution. I would just stop real, real quick and say foment a revolution actually to protect mainly slavery, right? So it's a kind of a civil war in a way. Um, the first like codified government version happens at that time. Right, so the, the thing that I start with in the very first chapter is the original legislation for the founding of the Texas Ranger Force is in 1835. And it's actually done, it's actually done during the first 1836, 1835 or 36. I, I, I'm a historian, but I can admit I suck at dates. But it's the first meeting of the provisional government of Texas. The legislation for the Ranger Force comes before the legislation founding the Army of Texas, right? I think that's that says something. They're, they could be concerned with a lot of things, and I actually list, like they could be concerned with setting up a capital or decent roads or establishing better mail service or anything a government might do. They're about to fight a revolution. They're going to need an army, but the... What comes before that is the founding of the Texas Rangers. So, like, that's the first, like, official government codified version of the group. And then throughout its history, um, the Rangers are kind of, I guess you could consider, like, what happens with the Canalius reforms, a similar example of this, where they're kind of recodified, re, the, you know, their numbers would decline. They would be, you know, oh, our, our border troubles are not that great anymore. A lot of what they did was... Um, um, like protection from indigenous groups and also capturing runaway slaves and slave people, right? So once you're past the Civil War, maybe we don't need these folks anymore. Oh, we'll keep them around for a little while. So there's sort of these this constant, like, maybe they'll go away, maybe they won't, and they're reauthorized. Um, 20th century, you have these border troubles, and the uh, 
uh, the governor, Pa Ferguson, is like, we need to augment the Rangers. And that's when they go from this force of like 24 or something like that to ultimately a, a thousand um, Rangers in that period in the early 20th century. There are Rangers in the Union later. Yeah. 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 It's actually pretty famous. There's um, like, that's the main one, but there are other like smaller kind of versions thereof and lots of Ranger memorabilia at different places. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a comment and a question for right. our Zoom audience. So comment is, I have a 1990s book compiled by a Hispanic writer who said for many decades in America, it was not a crime for a white person to shoot dead any Mexican person here believed to be quote illegal. And that it was not until 1974 before a border agent or officer was arrested for killing a Mexican man on the U.S. side of the border. I don't know what happened in that case. Your lecture confirms this writer's comments. And the question, in San Diego, for decades, there have been reports of not only gangs bringing in, quote, illegals, but also Mexican military made many, quote, incursions into the border on California and Texas for drug running, et cetera. How does this fit into your topic tonight? Um, so just to go back to the first comment really quickly, um, one of the things that I write about in this book, and it's also in the second book as well, is the number of times, um, usually American military officials, because the Border Patrol doesn't come around until uh, 1924. Um, so before that, it was almost always either customs inspectors or members of the Army that did basically border security. The number of times that they shot in the Mexico killing Mexicans and yeah nothing uh, and we don't even like a lot of these cases we don't even know why like why did you shoot that person uh, one of these cases that I write about is another kid right so why did you why did you kill that person we, we don't know they just um, they just did um yeah so having uh sort of come at age in the 80s um I remember a lot of the news reporting um, and now that I've done some of the research on that same period has been sort of confirmed by um, the research. This is all in the second book, so not really so much on what we've been talking about today. A um, lot of reporting on um, a like a Mexican people who would in a group basically rush the border and run across like the border bridges um, into the United States knowing that if you're in a group of like 15, 20 people, it's going to be really hard for border agents to nab everybody. So if you go in a group, you know, you'll be able to get through. But what that what that did and how it was sort of presented in the media, again, is sort of as like this horde of invaders um, coming through. Also, oftentimes they would show videos of um, usually always Mexican men in their underwear um, having crossed the river and they were in their underwear because they had taken off their clothes and put them in the plastic bags. But it always sort of sent this message of who Mexican people are and how they behave when you're, when your vision, the vision that a lot of Americans are getting is of some person emerging from the water, you know, mucky and whatnot in their underwear. Um, a lot of this stuff with, with the, like, so the drug trafficking happens um, the trafficking of humans um, through coyotes, we know, um, happens. There's no, uh, there's no, you know, there's no way around that. Um, what I would say is that a lot of times, and we've seen this recently, um, in particular with Jan Brewer in Arizona, a lot of times um, that is either and picked up by the media, I should say as well, that a lot of time is blown out of proportion. Um, it is exemplified and, and amplified in the media in much the same way that we might look at the sort of bandit label as being sort of overblown. Um, like a kernel of truth there, but some of the thing, like she talked about like mass beheadings and stuff like that. And it was like, it was just, it was just fiction. It didn't happen. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it does happen, but uh, a lot of times, like I said, is simply blown out of proportion and then used uh, for political purposes or used, uh, in the case of San Diego is a good one, especially in the um, late 80s and 90s, used to augment border security there, um, um, you know, to make, to make people uh, feel safe. So.
Fine, maybe I don't know. You may for the people online, though, Larry. Wonderful talk, and um, I can't read, wait to read the book. Um, one of the things that struck me was that, you know, going into the, you know, to the degree that we can go into the minds of these Texas Rangers, there always seems to be the need for the next atrocity, which suggests that what they're attempting to do just doesn't work. They're not good at the process of law enforcement. And we could tell the same story about Northern Ireland or about the West Bank and uh, the terrorists over there uh, or many other settings. But what listening to this, uh, the irony of it seemed to be that you were describing bandits, but the bandits were the Texas Rangers. And I'm just wondering, is that just my strange turn of mind or was that a theme you were trying to sneak across? Um, so I want to back up to, to where you started, uh, because I, I think you're absolutely right. And in a lot of ways, you use the word terrorism, right? Or, or there, that's, that's really a part of what this is designed to do, right? It's about control. It's about power, but the way that that is implemented or, um, manufactured, if you will, how it's pushed is through violence and terrorism. And so that's that's ultimately what a lot of this stuff is. Um, so this talk, uh, I sort of gave a draft version of at the most recent Western Historical Association meeting. And then I actually just published a blog on the Refusing to Forget um, website like a month ago now. And the title of that blog and the title of the paper, or the paper that I de delivered at the WHA, that, that title of that paper was called Ranger Bandits. The title of the blog was called Rangers as Bandits. And I make the case that you just talked about. I make the case that if you look at what they said bandits were, right? And, and you saw that language. That language, that language came directly from that talk. Bandits were viewed negatively. They were bad people. They were killers. They didn't care about laws or rights or justice. And I ended the talk at the WHA by saying, that's the Rangers. Like, that's what the Rangers were, were doing. So who really were the bandits in this particular story? Yeah. Thank you. It's always good when you're like, yeah, I just wrote something on that. This is great. Look it up. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I think we'll thank you again, Brian, for that excellent presentation. And uh, please consider joining us next month on March 21st for the next in the Your ISU Historian series. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.